<laughs> Amen. What a way to start the, start the morning, right? Mark, did we tell you how glad we're, to, uh, we're glad that you're back? <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and happy Cinco de Mayo. Yay! <laughs> well, welcome to Camarillo United Methodist Church. We're glad to be joining together in worship this morning, as always. And as always, I'd like to just remind you to fill out the, uh, the connection card, which is the back portion of your worship bulletin. And even if you're a regular tender, uh, just write your name and turn that portion out and have it ready with your offering. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, and for those of you who are joining us online, uh, go to our church website and fill out the online connection card, letting us know that you're joining us in worship this morning. Um, and on, also online, uh, you can also download the worship bulletin so you can follow along in the worship service. If you're new to our church this morning, we extend a special welcome to you and hope you enjoy worshiping with us this morning. If you um, uh, are interested more about the ministries and the various programs of the church, we invite you to uh, visit our church website to get to know more about the things that are going on uh, around this church. And if you do not have a regular place of worship, we hope that you consider making Camarillo UMC your church home. As we get, get together, I just want to draw your attention to a few announcements. Uh, first of all, I, I do, as I look up, realize, huh, we were a little shy today, and I realize. Uh, we're missing a whole bunch of our youth families and our bell choir because they are actually uh, visiting um, the All Souls Episcopal Church in Oxnard. Our bell choir is actually playing over there this morning. And so, again, it's one of those uh, ecumenical. Uh, we're actually coming together and, and uh, just uh, celebrating, worshiping together as one body, which actually, with the Episcopal Church, is actually one of the things that came out of the General Conference, which just concluded this, uh, uh, this past week, uh, we now have full communion with the Episcopal Church. Now, what does that mean? Right? Okay, you guys, something to clap about. <laughs> it's another way that we can say that we are truly one church. You know, throughout, throughout, throughout the, the centuries and uh, history, uh, the churches have, you know, has its schisms and splits, and we kind of know about that a, a, a little bit. Um, but, if, um, but throughout history, there are also unions where churches come together and also we come to understand that we are truly one church. And so, anyhow, just to let you know that that's where our bell choir, where Christy and some of our folks and our youth group are, are there uh, this morning. All right? A um, couple other announcements that I want to draw your attention. Thank you to all the volunteers that helped with the yard sale this past week. I know there was a lot of work. I saw a lot of folks coming together and, and just helping out. Again, uh, it's just wonderful to see all the volunteers uh, hard at work, as well as having fellowship, uh, not just amongst ourselves, but again, uh, getting to know um, our neighbors and, and those in the community that come by. Sometimes you got to have a yard sale to entice them to come on campus, right? And so, but it's, all, it's always good to, to see that. I was told by Nancy Paulson that uh, we made up something like 4,000, give or take. Not bad. So, yeah, that's pretty good. I think over the course of uh, the year, I think we, we've, we've gained about something like 12,000 uh, from last year. Uh, that, I don't know how many times we do it. Three, two, two, three times? Two, three, two, three times, something like that. So, <laughs> good going. It's good to kind of purge some of the things out of our garages, right? <laughs> All right. Hope you didn't just uh, refill it with the things from the garage sale. All right. Today, we, I am holding a new member orientation after worship at uh, 1045 in the conference room. So if uh, you're interested or have any questions about what, what does it mean to be a member of the church, I invite you to come and join, join me. Just ask some questions, and I'll kind of go over what, 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 uh, what membership entails and, and uh, what does it mean to be an official member of a church. Our monthly noontime uh, luncheon is this Wednesday with a Cinco de Mayo themed meal. If you're planning to attend, please let uh, Lisa Karawaki know. And our children's ministry is holding a parent night out this Friday. Um, drop off the kids, have a wonderful you know, night out. But RSVP is required, so please let Miss Story or Miss Christy know. Now, <laughs> yesterday, uh, many of you probably received a text, uh, supposedly from me, asking for assistance. And so if you brought your gift cards, please just drop them off into the offering plate. No, I'm just kidding. Um, 
<laughs> really. Uh, I hope none of you, I, I pray that none of you really fell for that scam. Uh, it's a very common scam that does go around. And so I just want to let everyone know and just remind you that if anyone asks you to buy gift cards through a text message or an email, please do not. Always call the church office or just or call the person uh, directly, not through the number that you got the text from or the email that you received an email from. Call them directly. If you don't know their number, call the church office. Again, it's unfortunate that these things happen, but I hope that nobody really fell for it. Um, be, what we think is someone, uh, uh, ac not accidentally, someone actually got into our church directory, which is online. Uh, what that means is that our church director has been pulled from our uh, from my website now. So if you do need some information, again, call the church office. All right. Uh, we're always grateful for the gift of altar flowers. And today we do have two arrangements. There's one. Oh, there's two. Um, and one of them is uh, given by Jan and Chuck uh, Barkey in celebration of Jan's mother, um, uh, uh, Layla Miller's 100th birth birthday. 100, yeah, 101. 101st. <laughs> Congratulations, Jan, for your mother, and may God continue to bless her with joy, peace, and just celebrations. Um, and we, our second arrangement is in celebration of Dory Malesko's there. Require 91st birthday. And her birthday is actually today. She was born on Cinco de Mayo. So, so Mark, are you still there? Can we sing happy birthday? I gotta put Mark to work. It's actually her birthday. It's <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Doris. Happy birthday. Not bad, we could have some more choir members. Um, after church, during fellowship time, I believe there is a cake, so uh, we'll have wonderful celebrations then. All right, uh, with that, uh, one last thing for those who are joining us online. Today is the first Sunday, so we do have communion, so I invite you to uh, prepare a, a piece of bread and a, a beverage um, so that you can ob uh, observe and participate in Holy Com Communion when we come to that part in the worship service. So with that, I'm going to invite everyone to stand as you're able. Turn your attention to our liturgist, Ricard Lemmer, as he leads us in the call to worship. Lord, open our hearts this morning to hear your words of compassion. Lord, tell us the truth is you. Lord, open our spirits this morning to strengthen our faith. Lord, make us ready to serve. Please join in singing our opening song, Together We Serve, found on page 2175 of our Faith We Sing songbooks.
morning. I'm glad you guys are here. I was looking around the church and I was thinking, "Uh uh-oh, it's going to be Mr. Bob and me up here all by ourselves, which means then I have to read to them. So I'm really glad you guys are here. So tomorrow, you may not know this, but it's the beginning of Teacher Appreciation Week. Wednesday is National Nurses Day, and next Sunday is Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And they're all days to show appreciation and thanks for people who help us and take care of us. How do we show appreciation to those folks? What do you think? Be kind and give them lots of candy. Be kind and give them lots of candy. I like that because I have two out of those three there. What else do you do? How can you show them you appreciate them? What could you do? You can hug them. them. Oh, everybody loves a hug. Everybody loves a hug. What else could you do? I'm thinking about the candy there. Sometimes when you get candy, it goes in a box and you wrap it up and put a ribbon on top. A present. Oh, chocolates. Oh, here we go. (laughs) We've got it. Yeah, a present. So whether it's a hug or whether it's candy, whether it's chocolate, you can bring some of that for me next week. Um, It's all about a gift. And another word for gift is a present. You've got it. Well, we have a book. Mr. Bob and I here have a book about a present. A little girl who needs a present and she's not exactly sure what to do and it's called mr rabbit and the lovely present so i've got the book here mr bob's going to be the rabbit and i'm going to be the little girl and we're going to read it to you so it's called mr rabbit and the lovely present sorry if you want to see the book later you'll have to come see us Mr. Rabbit and the Lovely Present by Charlotte Zolotow and pictures by Maurice Sendak. Mr. Rabbit, I want help. Help, little girl? I will give you help, if I can. Mr. Rabbit, it's about my mother. Your mother? It's her birthday. Happy birthday to her, then. What are you giving her? That's just it. That's why I want help. I have nothing to give her. Nothing to give your mother on her birthday? Little girl, you really do want help. I would like to give her something that she likes. Something that she likes is a good present. So off they go. But what? Yes. What? She likes red. Red? You can't give her red. Something red, maybe? Ah, something red. What is red? Well, there's red underwear. No, I can't give her that. Sorry, guys. There are red roofs. No, we have a roof. I don't want to give her that. There are red birds, red cardinals. No, she likes birds in trees. There are red fire engines. No, she doesn't like fire engines. Well, there are apples. Good, that's good. She likes apples, but I need something else. What else does she like? Well, she likes yellow. Yellow? You can't give her yellow. Something yellow, maybe? Oh, something yellow. What is yellow? I bet you guys have already figured out what it's going to be, huh? Well, there are yellow taxi cabs. Is that what you thought of? I'm sure she doesn't want a taxi cab. The sun is yellow. But I can't give her the sun, though I would if I could. 
A canary bird is yellow. She likes birds in trees. That's right. You told me. Well, butter's yellow. Does she like butter? We have butter. Bananas are yellow. Oh, good. That's good. She likes bananas. I need something else, though. What else does she like? She likes green. Green? You can't give her green. Something green, maybe? Emeralds. Emeralds are a lovely gift. I can't afford an emerald. Parrots are green, but she likes birds and trees. No, parrots won't do. Peas and spinach. Peas are green. Spinach is green. I wish you could see the faces up here. No, we have those for dinner all the time. Caterpillars. Some of them are very green. She doesn't care for caterpillars. How about pears? Bartlett pears. Oh, the very thing. That's the very thing. Now I have apples and bananas and pears, but... I need something else. What else does she like? She likes blue. Blue? You can't give her blue. Something blue, maybe? Lakes are blue. But I can't give her a, bla a lake, you know. Stars are blue. I can't give her stars, but I would if I could. Sapphires make a lovely gift. Remember this for Mother's Day. But I can't afford sapphires either. Bluebirds are blue, but she likes birds in trees. Right. How about blue grapes? Yes, that is good, very good. She likes grapes. Now I have apples and pears and bananas and grapes. That makes a good gift. All you need now is a basket. I have a basket. So she took her basket and she filled it with the green pears, the yellow bananas, the red apples and the blue grapes. It made a lovely present. Thank you for your help, Mr. Rabbit. Not at all. Very glad to help. Goodbye now. Goodbye. And a happy birthday and a happy basket of fruit to your mother. That's it. That's cool. Why do you think... Thank you. Why did the little girl need a present? Why'd she need a present? It was her mom's birthday, but why would she want to give her mom a birthday gift? To make her happy. Yeah, why else? Make her, uh, make her glad. Why do we want to make people happy and glad? Show them our appreciation. Ooh, show them our appreciation. There's another word though. It's a little bit shorter than appreciation, but it has a bigger meaning. Yes, sir. Grace. Grace, ooh, that one's good. It's shorter than appreciation, and it's big. There it is, love. We give people presents because we love them. And that's appreciation and that's grace. And now Mr. Bob's gonna tell you a little more. Okay. So when we love someone, we wanna share and we wanna give them something special to show how much we love them. God feels the same way about us, his beloved children. So he gave us the very best he had, his own son, Jesus, who shows us how to love. We can show that same kind of love to everyone we meet. What a lovely gift. What a lovely present. So can you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God 
Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your gift. Of your son Jesus. Of your son Jesus. To show us. To show us. How much you love us. How much you love us. Help us. Help us. To pass that love on. Pass that love on. To everyone we meet. To everyone we meet. So they also can know. So they also can know. How much you love them. How much you love them. Amen. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. come to a time now as we lift up prayers for um, all those around us and for uh, the world and the community. Um, but before I do pray, I just want to uh, share with you that, um, that we are saddened to share that uh, Joan McConnell uh, passed away this past week uh, on Monday uh, after a, a brief stay on hospice. Um, a memorial service is currently pending at this time, uh, but we pray that God will grant uh, the family and all of us, uh, peace and strength um, during this time of loss. Let's join together in prayer. Let's bow our heads. O God of love and of mercy, we give you thanks, O God, for this precious day as we come together that you give to us that we may gather together in worship, whether here in person or online, that wherever we are, that you call us to be the one church coming together to worship Lord, we come as a people seeking to know you and to know of ourselves. As we look upon ourselves and our lives, O oh God, we realize that we can only truly know or find our identity when we define ourselves in the reflection of your image. As you have created us, breathe into us your life, your love, your breath, your spirit. It gives us strength and the gifts to be your servants. And so we strive, O oh God, to be a people after your own heart. Unfortunately, O oh God, we know that we live in a world full of conflict and brokenness. We ask that you help us to live according to your call upon us, to be a church of open hearts, open minds, and open doors. We ask, O oh God, that you open our hearts to be that community of love, accepting of every person for who they are, just as you have accepted us for who we are. We are excited and grateful, oh God, for the decisions of the General Conference this past week that has opened the doors for people of all, all people, to come together to be of one church. Grant us hearts, O oh God, of compassion that we can be your servants that feeds the hungry, visits the lonely, and to witness to your love of all. Open our minds that we may be open, that we can open our hearts to all people, that, that our minds also means to, open minds also mean to have, be open to new ideas and of varying ways of thought. May we not think in one way, but expand our un understanding to lo learn and grow with others. We pray, O oh God, that our doors will always be open wide open, to reflect the grace of your love and the vastness of your kingdom. Lord, as we seek to be a people of love and of mercy, we lift up prayers for the many who seek your strength, guidance, and hope. We pray for the family and the friends of Joan McConnell as we all grieve her passing. Lord, may, may you grant us the assurance of faith that Joan exhibited in her final days of trusting in your resurrection and eternal life. 
We give you thanks for the life that we have shared together. We continue and we lift up prayers for Valerie Tho and for Connie Wenner, for Nancy Wood, for Ginger Brown, and for Florence Hironaka as they recover from their recent procedures. Lord, may you, may you continue to work through the doctors and the nurses in providing the care in which they need. Touch them with your healing presence. And may, may you embrace each and every one of them. Lord, there are many other prayers that we hold in our hearts. Receive them now as we lift them up to you in silence. God of love and of mercy. We give you thanks for being the, the source of our strength and the source of all hope. Continue to work within us to be your agent of love and grace to spread throughout the world. Use us as your instruments of healing for those in need. Call upon us to serve, to serve you in making a difference in the lives of others. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to please come forward as we uh, take this moment to give thanks to God for the various opportunities and the, the ways in which God um, guides us, to leads us to grow. So uh, with hearts of gratitude, uh, we give of our time, tithes, gifts, and our offering. Uh, that we may continue to expand the ministries of the church.
Please join in praying together the prayer of dedication displayed on the screens. All that we do is in your holy name, O God. Even as we share the riches of our labors, may we continue to honor your name in all that we do. Bless these gifts given freely, that your justice and mercy may prevail in a weak and weary world. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the letter of James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 and 14 through 17. Listen to James's admonition of the importance of faith shown through works. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it? my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of the Holy Scripture. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks as we come together and reflect upon the, the Scripture and the passage that we have just heard. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit be upon us. Fill this place in which we gather, fill the, 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 the space within our hearts that, that we may be open to what you have to say. Lord, we pray that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there's a story about uh, one of these uh, exclusive private schools uh, near Hollywood uh, Hills or whatever, uh, where many of the children of famous celebrities and movie stars go to. And one day a teacher asked um, her you know, privileged students, her privileged pupils, to write a composition on the subject of poverty. And one little girl started her literary essay like this. There once was a poor little girl. Her father was poor. Her mother was poor. Her nanny was poor. Her chauffeur, cha chauffeur was poor. And even her butler was poor. In fact, everybody in that house was very, very poor. Now, I get a sense that that little girl had no idea, right? Or never been really exposed to anyone. Uh, that was truly poor. There's a Peanuts cartoon that uh, 
somewhat illustrates this point. There it is. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know that Charles Schultz, uh, the creator of Peanuts, was a very devout uh, Christian. And in this comic strip, you see Snoopy uh, sort of shivering in the cold out in the snow. And so some of the kids, uh, might be Charlie Brown, one of the others, uh, come up to him and says, maybe we better go over and comfort him. And so they go over to Snoopy and say, be of good cheer, Snoopy, and then just walks away. And Snoopy is left there still in the cold and shivering and now confused. Kind of sad, isn't it? Kind of, but it kind of uh, uh, illustrates that point. Well, we're continuing this series, uh, Igniting Our Faith, uh, sort of based upon Adam Hamilton's book, A Revival, um, where for the past several weeks, uh, we've been looking at the life of John Wesley and how the early Methodist movement got started. If you remember, uh, um, in our previous uh, uh, Sundays, uh, the earlier events of Wesley's life, you know, he was born into a pastor's family. His father, Samuel Wesley, was an Anglican priest uh, in the Church of England. John Wesley went to Oxford uh, University where he studied philosophy, and he became a professor uh, in one of the colleges, Lincoln College in Oxford. It was there that he started the Holy Club with his brother Charles Wesley and some of the other students that he mentored, and they wanted to devote themselves to strict Christian living, to the Christian disciplines, making sure that they prayed several hours a day, you know, read the Bible several hours a day, you know, did whatever he took. And Wesley did this because even though he was already ordained as a minister at that time, he just didn't feel it. He didn't feel like he was sort of worthy of God's love. And like many of the church-going people at that time, you know, John Wesley didn't feel any passion in the faith. He was just going through the routines of being Christian, but he didn't feel it in his heart. So he even went on that mission trip, you know, trying to find his own soul, but it wasn't until after he's failed, failed many times, and sort of like hit rock bottom, that he came to realize that salvation is by faith alone. It's by grace. So John Wesley, with that heartwarming experience, that Alders get experience, you know, when he came to that realize, realization that God loves him no matter what, you know, that salvation is not dependent on how well he lives a Christian life, that he becomes excited. It's all about the grace of God. It's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 that we read last week, how John Wesley got excited about his faith, and he wanted to tell everyone about it. But when he tried to do so, when he tried to preach the, the message of love and grace of God you know, in the churches, and unfortunately to the churches at that time, there was a certain level of stature you had to be in order to be in the churches. Well, those folks didn't quite like what he was saying. They accused him of being way too enthusiastic about his faith and kicked him out. And it wasn't until a friend invited him into the countryside to preach to the commoners, the coal miners, the factory workers, the, the workers in the fields, that thousands of people started to come to hear him preach. Now that leads to today's passage in the letter of James, where the writer says, Brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and says, you know, sit here, please, you know, have a seat here. While to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's from Scripture. You see, during the time of John Wesley, you know, again, the people that, who were working in the fields and the coal mine, in the coal mines were not exactly the folks that you would find in the churches they might not have felt welcome in the churches. We kind of have an idea of what that looks like because 
throughout history, we know that there have been folks that have never really felt welcome in the churches. And one of the exciting things that happened this week at General Conference is we were able to remove some of those languages, especially the language that stated that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. That got removed. It's no longer in our book of discipline. You should be excited about that. Because things that hinder and restrict people from coming to faith, to coming to being part of the church, should not be part of the church. So, again, back in the days of John Wesley, these folks didn't feel like they were welcome in the, fo- in the churches. The big Catholic, you know, the classic cathedrals were for the nobles and the wealthy who had the means to worship. The commoners were often ignored and never had access to attend church. It was an eye-opening experience for John Wesley to be able to preach to the people in the fields and have thousands come to hear him when he barely had maybe a hundred in, in the churches. And John Wesley began shifting how he did ministry. There's an ancient uh, Jewish folktale that tells about a time when the Israelites were wandering in the desert. They asked, uh, decided to ask God for di- uh, they decided to ask God to come to dinner. <laughs> and their Moses, remember this is a folktale. Uh, their Moses uh, explained to the people that you know God is not a physical being; He doesn't eat. But when God went to the mountain to talk to, uh, but but when Moses went up to the mountain to talk to God, God said to him that, yeah, I accept the invitation that he was going to go and and have dinner. Well, the next day, all day long, the Israelites prepared this fabulous feast with God. But then a, a man, poor, hungry, an old man, came by and asked for something to eat. But the Israelites were too busy to give the old man some food. And that evening, the Israelites looked for God, but they couldn't see him. The next morning, Moses went up the mountain and asked God why he stood up, stood up uh, the people for dinner. And you guys can understand what God's response would have been, right? I did come. If you had fed the old man, you would have fed me. It kind of is similar. We have a similar story, don't we, in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus separates the, the goats and the sheep. You know, remember that story? You know, to the goats, he's, he, he says, Away from me, for you did not give me something to eat when I was hungry or something to drink when I was thirsty. You, you did not visit me when I was in prison or when I was sick. And when they ask, Well, when have I seen you, you know, Lord? When have we seen you hungry or thirsty or, in, or um, in prison or sick? His response was, when, we, when you didn't do it for the least of these, you didn't do it for me. In that story, you know, both the sheep and the goats call out to Jesus, Lord, Lord. But how each group treated the poor, the hungry, the widow, the sick, and the prisoners indicated whether they were truly following Jesus or not. You know, Martin Luther didn't like the, uh, the letter of James. You know, he called it the, the, the gospel of straw. Now, what does that mean, right? Nothing to stand upon, basically, he's saying. For him, it was, you know, for Martin Luther, it was all about the faith, that salvation is only by believing in Jesus, whereas for James... James talks about the necessity for our faith to be shown in action. You see, Martin Luther was reacting to the the Catholic Church, which at that time was heavily emphasizing works and deeds for salvation, primarily because they were doing a capital campaign to build cathedrals, and and in in return, they, they, they required certain amounts of works. When I say certain amount, a certain amount of offering or indulgences in order to receive salvation or else you'll be stuck in purgatory. So Martin Luther 
was reacting to that. He, heav- he heavily rejected that, that notion that works was necessary for salvation because of that. But James writes, what good is it if you say that, that you have faith but do not have works? If a brother or sister is naked or, and lacks food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and have your fill, and yet do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? Sort of like what the kids did to Snoopy, right? Be of good cheer, but leave them out in the cold. So James says, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. You see, there's valid points in both, right? Yes, salvation is about faith. It's about the grace of God, God's love for us. And there's nothing that we can do to earn that. That's what John Wesley came to realize at Aldersgate. Yet at the same time, we just go around saying, I'm, I, I can do whatever I want now because I'm saved by grace. Is that truly living the life as a disciple of Christ? No. There has to be action that follows through. There's valid points for both. For John Wesley, you know, he lived uh, about a hundred some years after Martin Luther, recognized the need for both. Faith, or what he calls acts of piety, There's a, there it is, or the works of piety, or works, or the acts of mercy. One of the characteristics of the Methodist movement was that rather than take sides on opposing issues, Methodists try to find a common ground, a middle ground, and understand, seek to understand and respect the views of opposing, opposite extremes, to be able to hold that intention and be of one body. You know, in seminary, uh, the, the term that I uh, came to, to learn and, and use quite often when faced with opposing options, is not to choose either or, but instead be able to say both and bringing it together. The debate between whether salvation is by faith, you know, acts of piety, like worship and devotion and prayer and, you know, study and stuff like that, or through our works, you know, acts of mercy, you know, um, acts of compassion and justice, well, the response is both. Both are necessary to live the life of a disciple of Christ. Some churches tend to focus on one or the other, right? Um, one of the, my best friends in college, he was a son of a, a Pentecostal minister, and so his church I visited uh, several times. It was pretty fun. <laughs> you know, it's always fervent and, and exciting. And, uh, you know, sp- they're, they're very fervent about spreading the gospel and telling others about Jesus Christ and evangelizing and, and calling them into the church and, and, and just, you know, the really focused, just focused on um, just telling the, you know, other people about Jesus Christ and making sure that they, everyone read the Bible and prayed diligently, faithfully. On the other hand, I had a church administrator, my previous appointment, my previous church, who came out of the Salvation Army Church. And, and for her, it was all about focusing on serving the poor and ministries of justice and compassion, which is a part of the, the works of mercy. Now, the interesting thing about these two churches you know, these two churches have slightly different ways of doing ministry, but they're both valid. And the interesting thing about these two churches, both the, the Pentecostal church and the Salvation Army church, is that you know where they came out of, right? They both grew out of the Methodist church. We're all part of the one body. Living a life of faith meant, means devoting to both our spiritual well-being through acts of piety and living out our faith through the works of mercy. When John Wesley was in Bristol, where he first started you know, um, uh, preaching outdoors to the people in the fields and the miners, 
he started that church, right, called the New Room, which I showed you a pic picture last week uh, that we'll be taking the, the youth to, uh, to Bristol to, um, uh, to, to visit that place. Uh, oh, gosh, it's next month. Okay, there's still a lot of planning to do, be, get done. But yes, you know that you know, that's one of the places that our youth are, are going to next month. You know, that, 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 um, that church, you know, held Bible studies and prayer, prayer meetings, but it also served the people in teaching, you know, having the schools and, and providing meals. During John Wesley's ministry, he's traveled all throughout England, establishing churches um, that did the same thing as the New Room. In fact, it was calculated that he traveled over 250,000 miles on horseback. How many of your cars have 250,000 miles on it? Right? Okay, well, we, okay we have a couple of cars. <laughs> Going for auction? No. Um, close. <laughs> but, yes, he traveled. John Wesley traveled over 250,000 miles. I don't know if it was one horse or he went through a couple of horses. But anyhow, um, he went from Bristol to London to Epworth and, you know, made his circuit. You know, that's where the, the circuit riders, well, you know, kind of got started with John Wesley and then continued on in the, the, the States. But he went through all these, constantly preaching about the grace of God and encouraging churches to serve the community. Well, in London, one of the, another place that we'll be visiting, John Wesley started the Foundry, okay, which became the headquarters of Methodism and where he lived uh, till he died. Well, Foundry's nearby where he lived. Um, he purchased this building. It's a picture of it because it's no longer standing. Uh, but he purchased it in, in 1739, uh, just a year after his conversion, for 900 pounds, which was a lot of money back then. The building was actually used as a munitions depot where they made cannonballs and artillery during one of the wars. But Wesley converted a building that, that made weapons or, or ammunition for war, he converted it to be a place of healing. It became a church. He built a worship space that sat 1,500 people, a place where, where um, there was uh, classes where they could teach children how to read and write. There was a clinic where they could, um, where they could treat people who were sick, Many people didn't realize, but John Wesley was actually a, a pioneer in electroshock therapy. How many of you guys knew that? That he was a pioneer in electroshock therapy, which was uh, used in many medical advancements at the time. The churches that, the, you know, that John Wesley built were places where people could practice their faith, acts of piety, but also a place where the works of mercy can be exercised. I wonder how God may be calling us, our church, to serve the community as well. You know, we have, we have our medical mission project, our medical supply project, you know, it's like, much like the foundry where people come for their medical needs. We have our education programs where children can learn, you know, come and learn not only about the Bible, but, but skills that are missing in our public school systems like music. And we serve as a community center sometimes where people gather, you know, not only those who come on Sundays, but, but other times for fellowship, connections, like our noontime luncheons. But there's so much more that I know God is calling us, nudging our hearts. And I pray that we have our hearts open to see the needs of our community and hear the cries of the needy and be the hands and feet of Christ to serve the world. And as we come together at this table, each month we are reminded, reminded of what it means to be the body of Christ, to remind the world, the community, that the table that Jesus calls us to is one that is open to all people, all people, without restriction. And so, as we come now, I invite you to uh, turn to the, the litany of Holy Communion that, that, that's in the pew pockets in front of you.
as we enter into this time of remembering what it means to be the body of Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed and your love remained steadfast, you delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to the land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so by, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, O God, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. When the Lord ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. And so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ come in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. And with the confidence as children of God, let us join, join together in praying the prayer in which Christ Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just want to remind you that, again, in our Methodist tradition, we uh, observe what is known as open communion, which means everyone is welcome to participate and partake of the elements. Uh, you, do not, you do not have to be a member of this church. Um, or any church, or you don't even need to be baptized. If for us, communion is a table, an open table that reminds us of the love and the grace of God, where you are welcome to come. Everyone is welcome to come without any restriction. So I invite you as the ushers uh, direct you to come forward to receive the elements. You will receive a piece of bread as well as there's a tray of juice um, to take the bread and to take the juice, and then uh, to partake of it. Um, there will be ushers uh, with trays that uh, you can uh, dispose of your uh, plastic cups. The table is ready. Come and receive the elements. Oh, 
Let us all join together in the prayer following communion found in your, well, on the screen. Let us all pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Jesus Christ our Lord. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing song, Wounded World That Cries for Healing. Beverly, do you want to come forward? Oh, which Beverly? Me, we have more than one? <laughs> Beverly Shipman. <laughs> um, the reason why she's coming forward is today is her last Sunday with us. Beverly, um, of course, moved here from Idaho because, well, she came and was with... Um, Nancy during her final days and uh, was with us for just a year, two years, year, year and a half. But she is uh, moving to Ohio, uh, where you know Dawn's family farm, and and she's gonna go and um, start a whole new life there. And so I know we miss her, and so I just wanted her to uh, be here, and so that we can uh, bless her uh, and and send her off well. So. Let's join together in prayer. Oh, gracious, loving God, we are truly grateful for uh, just the ways in which you lead all of us, how our lives cross and our paths cross. Lord, we pray that, um, again, giving thanks to you for the, the, 
the, the year, year and a half that Beverly was able to uh, be here uh, and engage and be part of our everyday ministry here at Camarillo. Lord, we pray that as she goes forth to start a new life in Ohio, that your Holy Spirit go with her. Pave the path before her, O oh God. Watch over her. Grant her your strength. Grant her your wisdom. Grant her your peace. That in, in all the, that you have in store for her, O oh God, that your spirit walk with her. Lord, we know that you will always protect her as you have continued to be with us. And we know, O oh God, that um, even though she, she settles in Ohio, that there will be many, many, many opportunities where we can continue to, to meet each other, visit with each other. And so, oh God, this is not goodbye, but we give you thanks for our time together. We just pray that your spirit, that your Holy Spirit be Beverly's strength and guide each and every day. May she always remember and always know that she has a family here and the love of this congregation goes with her. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. With that, let us all, let us all go for living the life that Christ calls of, calls of us. To live in, with acts of piety, learning, growing in faith, but to live out works of mercy that share, that makes a difference in others' lives. That we go and serve the poor, the needy, everyone that we see. May you be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.